Cool. This is, uh, I guess, an especially uh, pleasurable episode to do, given that um, I get to have the discussion with my co-founder and uh, also my sibling. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I thought we could just start with um, how much you kind of remember from uh, your childhood uh, and, you know, being a middle child, uh, how potentially you, you think that affected and impacted your uh, mindset in terms of eventually becoming an entrepreneur? I mean, definitely the order you're born in has a big impact on your personality. Um, you know, most elder siblings, middle, youngest, all have very similar personality types, regardless of the family they're raised in. Um, in terms of being an entrepreneur, yeah, I guess, you know, there's more of a chip on your shoulder. You, you know, want to always go out there and, and prove yourself. Um, and I think that's a pretty useful trait for being an entrepreneur. Yeah, no, I, uh, <coughs> I totally uh, agree. I think uh, the order, uh, a lot of our personalities built in our childhood. And so as you mentioned, kind of the, the pecking order definitely has an impact uh, whether we want to want to admit it uh, or not. And I guess when you reflect back on your on your childhood growing up, um, what kind of memories come back to you that you feel started building the foundation for you to eventually become an entrepreneur? Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time reflecting on my childhood, but probably, you know, things that were good indicators of me becoming an entrepreneur, probably trying to learn to ride a bike on two wheels, right? I wanted to do that before you. So I was probably five, six years old when I started riding a bike on two wheels, crashed pretty badly, um, wasn't ready. You know, I only had the training wheels on for, I think, one or two days, maybe even less before I said, let's take them off. Um, Reading, you know, I, I was very intent on being able to read before I went into first grade. Um, so I think those are the memories that kind of I can look back on and say indicated my mindset and my personality. I definitely um, recall you uh, trying to ride a bike with just two wheels uh, at a very young age and deciding that going downhill was the right way to capitalize on your newfound uh, skill. And uh, that definitely ended up with you in a thorn bushes uh, crying like a baby. So I, so I remember the memory from a different perspective. Probably my first time riding a bike, if I remember correctly. And, you know, I rode with the training wheels. I said this was pretty easy. And then I told my dad, let's take them off. And he said, no, you're not ready. Um, and the more, you know, people are saying, no, you can't do it. You're not ready. The more I wanted to do it. So I was just really stubborn about it. And then eventually he decided that he would take them off. And yeah, as you mentioned, uh, went downhill and had a pretty bad accident. I think um, you, you used a specific word, uh, stubborn. I remember kind of as a kid growing up, there was definitely an element of, of being stubborn. And I guess how much of that do you think is a, an advantage and how much of that do you think is a, is a disadvantage as you started to grow up, get into the workforce and get into what would eventually become starting a pretty successful startup? Your biggest strength is probably always your biggest weakness as well. And being stubborn was definitely more of an advantage than a disadvantage in terms of trying to start my own business. Um, as you get older, more and more people tell you what you can't do. Less and less people encourage you. Um, you have more doubters, more haters. And unless you could just focus on yourself and your motivation, um, and your goals, then you're probably not going to make the leaps you should be making in your life. And if I wasn't stubborn, I definitely would have not reached the point I've reached today. 
there's a lot of reasons for me not to do what I did, to start a company, to quit my job, to invest my savings. Um, even after we started the company, right, a lot of the moves we wanted to make probably wouldn't have made them if I wanted to listen to other people uh, instead of have conviction. Um, having said that, of course, it has you know a lot of weaknesses as well when you're stubborn. Um, you don't necessarily listen to people. It takes you longer to digest feedback, information, um, and to change course when you should be changing course. And how have you kind of tried to balance that uh, as you've become more self-aware and more mature? How have you, tr- how have you tried? Uh, you know, that, what, that statement you made really resonates with me, which is your biggest strength is your biggest weakness. Um, so how do you try to find the balance between making sure that more often than not it is a strength and then you minimize the weakness as much as possible? A lot of it's about surrounding yourself with the right people um, who will challenge you and, and debate you. And you have to seek out alternative views. You have to seek out diversity. People who don't necessarily think like you, who don't act like you, um, who don't have the same personality. Um, and you have to approach things more from a place of curiosity more than anything else. Right? When you approach things from a place of curiosity, Even though you have disagreements, you end up working with the counterparty to come up with better choices. You obviously grew up in the U.S. and um, ended up moving to the to the UAE. And uh, as a kid growing up, you moved around quite a bit. So I know uh, moved around four times uh, before you got to high school. What was that experience like growing up? Yeah, I think. It was very interesting moving to different schools, different countries. I'm quite an introvert. I always had a close circle of friends. And I'd say it was also very difficult, right? I think middle school was a very difficult time for me. We moved from um, Abu Dhabi to Saudi Arabia halfway through the year um, and then left Saudi Arabia halfway through the school year to come back to Dubai. Um, and that was very difficult. So if I look at, you know, uh, my f- circle of friends, none of them come from that middle school period. And I remember there, you know, it was difficult to connect with others. Um, um, and I wasn't very social. Um, and I think that really sort of drove me to start reading a lot, become much more intellectually curious and spend more time in my own thoughts and that ended up being a great thing for what i wanted to do in life which was start my own business and do you remember the the point at which you decided i'm gonna entrepreneurship is is the path i'll pursue did that is that something that naturally happened uh, as as you grew up or was there a moment in time where you can recollect this was kind of the inflection point i remember as a kid In elementary school, one used to play games and, you know, pretend. I'd pretend I was a business owner. So it's really from back then, I'd pretend like I was starting a company um, or I was a stock trader, uh, which was a bit weird, right, for for a kid to be pretending as. But um, it started from back then. And the other part was, yeah, I never really had an interest in working for big companies. It was just never a motivation for me. Didn't even really want to apply to those companies. Um, I applied to all the big consulting firms, actually, after I graduated and hated the interview process. Um, Didn't really like the people I was meeting. They just it seemed like they thought they were just smarter than me. Um, And that drove me to say, you know what, let's go build a place where we can actually help people grow um, and let people be themselves, right? <clears throat> Not judging others. And I think the what gives me the most pride is when we hire people who are underdogs, right? We get people who didn't necessarily go to the best universities, didn't come from blue chip employers, and they start doing amazing things at the company. And I think that for me is, uh, resonates a lot with my personal experience. I got rejected from McKinsey, from BCG, from Bain, 
um, didn't get into any of the big investment banks, um, didn't even get interviews with them. And I was like, screw it, uh, I can build something better. I mean, still, there's a long way to go to build something better, but um, it's a much more fun journey, that's for sure. Even the uh, undergrad you pursued uh, wasn't, uh, uh, I'd say, the standard uh, undergrad op- uh, choice for, for most uh, most students. And so you end up graduating high school in Dubai and then you went on to do your undergrad in biomedical engineering. H- how did you choose your major? Yeah, so actually I wanted to be a zoologist. Um, you know, since I was young, I had pretty much every type of animal, um, rabbits, turtles, gerbils, cats. Um, and I chickens. wanted to pursue that passion. Yeah, uh, my younger brother had chickens and I had the rabbits and then um, we forced them to hang out with each other. Uh, and it was like an animal utopia in the house. Exactly. Was and there an animal you wish, uh, you wish you were able to get that you never, that's, never did? That's a leading question. So I wanted the goat when I was younger and the falcon as well. Um, didn't get either of those. Why a goat? I can't really remember why I wanted the goat. I think we used to go somewhere to look at horses and ride horses. And I think there was a goat there. I was friends with the horses. He'd hang out with them. I thought that was pretty cool. And they used to feed him anything. He used to eat cigarettes even. And I was like, whoa, this is a pretty cool animal. We need to get one. So I want to be a zoologist and... um, the financier of my education, you know, didn't think it was a good idea. At the same time, I mean, I was pretty good at biology. I liked it. Um, always been good at math. Never really had to study for for math. So a very practical approach. I said combine the two, biology, mathematics, or engineering, um, and decided to pursue bioengineering. Um, my dad wanted me to also go into medicine potentially, so that you know left the door open. Although I, I wasn't really planning on going down that path, but at least I could explore it. Most people from that major ended up going to medical school. Medical school, so I, I was always willing to try. Right, I never really said no to anything. Um, um, you know, I wasn't the type to say, "Oh, because uh, I couldn't do zoology, I'm not going to go do medical school because that's what my dad wanted me to do." I always looked at upside and downside and, you know, there was only upside from taking that uh, major and, and seeing if I could potentially be interested in a career in medicine, which I, obviously I was not. After four years of bioengineering, I just wanted to get out of school. And so you <clears throat> graduate at a great time to, to finish school, which is uh, the global financial uh, crisis. What was that like? So I was graduating in June 2008. Um, the global recession had started in the U.S., was picking up a lot of pace. I remember going to the career fair and there was barely any companies there. It was just a very grim atmosphere. And then there was one oil services company. I just gave them my CV and then they got in touch. They said, you know, why don't you come interview with us? Um, they flew me out to Louisiana. It was pretty intense experience of, you know, pretty much 18 hours straight of interviewing. I got the job offer, had no interest at all um, in in doing that uh, or going into that field. Um, The compensation was crazy. It was six figures as a fresh grad, right? Um, And that made it a bit more difficult as a choice. But um, in the end, I decided not to go ahead with the offer. And... I tried to stay in Los Angeles uh, to look at other career opportunities, but there was nothing really. Um, And thankfully, I was able to come back to Dubai and, you know, funny enough, got a job in investment banking. I started two weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed. And as a fresh grad, you're looking around, people are acting like it's the end of the world, right? The banking system is going to completely deteriorate, deteriorate. And 
I had no idea what was going on. I was just watching the news every day, coming home, watching CNBC, markets going down, people are freaking out, companies going bankrupt. And that was an amazing experience overall because I saw how much people were panicking and sort of this Armageddon doomsday scenario. But then within 12 months, we went on into the probably longest bull market in history. And everyone kind of forgot about the global recession. And once COVID started in 2020, my view was shaped by that experience where I was saying, it's going to get really bad, but before we know it, it's going to be behind us. Even, you know, took my savings and started putting them in stocks in the last week of March, first week of April, um, and just put everything in, in stocks because I knew they were going to go back up. And I could also see the people who hadn't been through that 2008 experience, um, including some investors and, and maybe some board members as well, were really panicking quite a bit. Right? They thought, you know, we had to really go into hibernation mode. Um, but the learning is the cycles will always come and go. And human memory is very short. I mean, even think about now, right? Uh, COVID is still going on, but people are just forgetting about it and moving on. Um, and that's something that I'll always keep in mind, right? Don't let the highs get too high or the lows get too low. And how much of that <clears throat> do you think has translated to your personality, right? Um, one thing that kind of, I guess said differently, you know, one thing that you're uh, f quite known for within Bezat is always having a cool head, regardless of how stressful the situation may seem. Where do you think that comes from? I mean, I've always been like this, right? I've always been pretty good under stress, under pressure. Um, for me, I came from a place where I was just always practical and logical. I didn't know what it was called till, you know, a year or two ago, but I was pretty much following stoicism my whole life. For me, the hard part was learning the emotional aspects, right? And developing emotional intelligence. Um, some people have the opposite journey, right? They have the emotional intelligence, but then they have to uh, develop the more practical, level-headed thinking. So I came from the opposite direction. And yeah, I mean, I've always been like that. I always think no matter how good things are, they could be better. No matter how bad things are, they could be worse. So why spend so much time thinking about what else things could be versus what they just are? And at the end of the day, anything you want to do, it, it takes what it takes. It's that simple. It's not about it's hard or it's easy. It just takes what it takes. Could you elaborate on that? I mean, I, I can go back to school, right? If we knew this was one of the hardest professors, and we knew the curve was, you know, based on 70% failure rate. People would be thinking about it all the time. That's all they'd talk about. They'd look at ways to drop the class or they'd end up graduating later because they wanted to drop the class and there was nothing else to, to take instead. Um, for me, the approach was, I got put in this class. What, what can I do about it? I don't control the professor. So I just have to go in and execute and do my best. Um, so there's no emotions attached to the objective and the plan that you have to execute to get there. And the mentality for me was someone's going to pass the class, someone's going to get an A people that are sitting around me so why can't it be me that whole experience of going through the global financial crisis people you know uh, felt like I, I remember just felt like the world uh, there was a meltdown uh, globally 
um, and you were right smack in the midst of it with your being kind of in uh, investment banking slash private equity. Um, what was kind of going through your head in terms of, okay, how's this going to impact my career? What happens next? I mean, it's a very scary time to be alive, to be a fresh grad. I, rem <clears throat> I remember just most people when they leave college actually have no freaking clue what they want to do, right? They just take the first job that comes their way. And then actually a lot of times graduating from college for most people is a process of figuring out what you don't want to do versus actually understanding what you do want to do. And, um, and so there's very little guidance around helping people make the decision uh, around what they want to do with their life. And from kind of primary school all the way through college, there's absolutely minimal frameworks around that. And so landing on what you want to do in life usually happens through a process of elimination. And so I can imagine it being quite scary saying, okay, <laughs> I've been studying for, you know, 16 years of my life preparing me for this moment to get a job and now i'm in the middle of you know a shit show needless to say I ended up having a lot of free time on my hands in that job right you know being invested in western banking towards the end of 2008 you weren't getting a lot of deal flow you weren't getting a lot of face time to place deals so i had a lot of free time um and I just decided to make use of that free time to keep preparing myself. So I started doing my CFA charter, um, ended up passing all three levels. And the first two levels I did while I was in investment banking, I would just use the free time to study. A lot of people were just not coming to the office or going to the movie theaters, long lunch breaks, things like that. But I just made use of the time, right? That's what I controlled was my, was my time. And I knew I could prepare myself. Ideally, I would have been getting the learnings and the experience from doing things on the job, working on deals, but that wasn't happening. So I had to keep learning. It was my first job. And that means it was mostly self-learning. That's really how I dealt with the, with the uh, crisis, as I just said. I, I'm in my first job. I have to be learning something. So let's get to it and just invest it in myself. And that helped me, of course, you know, get the next job. Um, I saw a lot of people who just lost, you know, two years or a year to two years because, um, yeah, they did progress in their career. They got better jobs after wh wherever they were at during 2008, but they didn't really learn much. And I think it's more important to learn things than, especially early in your career, than focus on job titles and how much you're earning. That takes a lot of discipline to go through um, self-learning in general uh, I know that's something I didn't develop until my 30s w where does kind of that discipline come from I mean you refer to it as discipline I think for me it's impatience right um, I was always uncomfortable when I knew I had something to do so the fact that I said let me do my CFA the moment I signed up it just became sort of a burden right I just became very impatient I need to study, I need to get out of the way. Um, same thing, you know, in school, right? I'd come home, I'd do my homework just because I want to get out of the way. I don't want it hanging over me. So for me, the discipline just comes from impatience, the things I need to do. I need to get them out of the way. Um, and I don't really hate doing anything, right? Um, there's a quote from Mike, Mike Tyson, which is, discipline is doing what you hate to do but doing it like you love it i wouldn't say i do it like i love it but i do it because i need to do it and i don't think about the fact that i don't want to do it you don't kind of let the emotional side of this sucks or this is time consuming or this is um something that's not super enjoyable get in the way of actually getting it done yeah and it's a big adjustment right when you start getting more responsibility um, as a leader in the business world. You have more and more to do. Um, you have to multitask and your checklist of to-dos keeps growing every single day. 
So you really have to adjust that mentality because otherwise you'll just burn out and you become very stressed. So later on, it's actually started to work against me, right? Um, this impatience. And you really have to start becoming more present and just focusing on day by day. So it helped me grow, but then it became a handicap very quickly once I became a CEO. When does the idea of kind of starting Bezat come to play? Around 2013. I mean, look, I had a lot of ideas. Um, I have a notebook where I just keep a lot of ideas. And I was playing cards at a shisha place with Brian, our other co-founder, and told him about the idea. And he said, "Let's. it's great, let's do it. So we just, you know, met up the next week. We started creating a plan. Um, and we just started executing the plan. We started, you know, um, um, hiring, interviewing engineers, agencies to develop the initial website. Um, and for almost a year, if I recall correctly, we both kept our full-time jobs and we just work on weekends. And we ended up hiring three people as well. We had sort of a, a live POC. Um, There's no venture ecosystem back then, right? Uh, the first institutional investor that we raised from wasn't even established back then. So the journey was very different than what co-founders today go through. Um, and I ended up leaving my job when we raised some angel investment and Brian kept his job and he paid me part from his salary so that we wouldn't, you know, so that the angel funding would take us longer. We didn't want to spend it on me, we wanted to spend it on marketing, on hiring more people. Um, why did we choose this concept? I mean, there's a lot of other concepts, to be honest. It was just because it resonated with him and on my own, I wasn't really going to do anything, probably. So it just ended up being the initial concept for Bezat that we went with. How important did you, do you, when you look back at it, how, how important was it to have a co-founder versus doing something on your on your own now that you've kind of been at it for for uh, uh, seven years? How important was it for you personally to have a co-founder uh, through the journey? Yeah, I mean, it's very important. There's a lot of VCs that won't invest in single founders, right? They only invest if you have co-founders. And the reason is one, I mean, obviously there's a lot of work to be done and it's hard for one person to do it on their own in the early stages, especially when you don't have the capital to hire people. And two is when you have a co-founder, there's a different level of trust there. Um, and that's probably the most important thing in terms of building up your confidence um, to scale the business, to approach other VCs. You need to have someone who has your back and, and you have theirs. And then the last one is, especially in those early days, was the network, right? There wasn't, especially when it came to fundraising, there wasn't angel networks. There weren't a lot of VCs around. Um, it was just us hustling our own networks. And when you have a co-founder, you've doubled the size of your network. Um, so I think from all these angles, it's, it's very important. And then as you start building up the executive team, if you have the right co-founders in place, you've established that culture of trust between each other and as you bring in more executives it, it kind of seeps into them as well right and they all start becoming like co-founders in many ways back then kind of in the 2013 to 2015 period uh, uh, like you said there wasn't the the venture ecosystem and the angel ecosystem was quite it was even pre-infancy, right, uh, at that stage. And so what was the fundraising journey like uh, back then? And, you know, how did you kind of go from, from C to Series A? The fundraising journey was pretty interesting. So the first round we raised, the angel round, was friends and family, but then 50% of the money came from individuals that we didn't know. Right. They're just introductions made by different people. Um, and that was very interesting, the fact that people we had never met before were willing to back us, not only in, in the UAE, but you know from, from the US as well. And then going into the Series A, we knew we had to start raising sort of more institutional capital. And 
what we ended up doing was we, we had no idea, you know, how it works, right? You need to go get a lead, you get co-investors and things like that. So we thought it was okay to set the terms ourselves. So we created our own term sheet. We raised half the round from angel investors. And then we went to one VC and we said, look, there's half remaining. Uh, why don't you guys come in? You created your own lead. Yeah, which is very different than how it's done today. Um, back then, also, the valuations were extremely low. right? I mean, I, I guess only in retrospect you can say they were low, but the dilution was pretty huge. Um, seed rounds were going at you know pre-monies of $1, $2 million in this region uh, for most companies. So the dilution was, was pretty huge. Um, and the mindset was very different as well, right? There was less focus on product market fit versus getting traction as soon as possible, getting some revenue in the door. That was very challenging, right, in retrospect, because you don't really end up allocating your, your resources properly. Um, if you fast forward to today, it's a completely different ballgame, right? Um, uh, today, you know, we're at the highs of the high when it comes to, to venture. Um, people are optimizing for very different things on the investment side. A lot of investors care less about IRR versus how much capital they can deploy now. Right. Um, so the game's changed drastically, I would say, in a very short time period. I'm saying since 2015. It's not even recognizable anymore. What do you think are kind of the pros and cons of how the the ecosystem has evolved? Uh, what do you think the pros and cons of that are and the impact it has on startups in the region? A lot of jobs are being created for younger people. Um, sure, a lot of them are going to fail. And they're going to burn a lot of investors' money. Um, but in the long term, it's kind of bringing in this new generation, right, into the workforce. So we're going to think differently. We're going to be taking bigger risks. The cons are people not just focusing on basic economics and basic financial fundamentals. Um, again, you know, VC was always something that should be doing 30% RR plus. It's obvious that a lot of VCs are not targeting those returns anymore. They may say they do, but they're definitely not. Rather, they just want to be able to invest in companies and give them more money than they need. Because the more they can deploy, the bigger funds they can raise. And then it trickles down, it actually goes back to that 08 financial crisis, full circle. Because there's so much cheap money available. And VC in some ways becoming one of the cheapest sources of funding you can get. Um, and with so much free money in the global economy, then it's VCs, you know, it's trickled down to VCs. There's a lot of new VCs, um, ones you've never heard of that are doing, you know, 750 million billion dollar funds. So there's a lot of competition to deploy this capital. And as a result, as entrepreneurs, we're being forced to really focus on growth. We're developing a lot of unhealthy habits. I stopped reading TechCrunch two years ago because I realized it's basically just like social media for startups. There's so much noise and this company raised this much and you start feeling bad about yourself. Why didn't I raise this much? But again, why do you need to compete with other people on how much money you've raised. Why is that becoming the barometer of success versus how good of a product you're building, how much your customers love you, uh, what kind of culture you have in the company, how many people are you helping grow and develop and become better people. Um, these are the things that matter in the long, long run, right? People literally today will start a company and say, my goal is to IPO in three years. That's not a vision for a company. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that you, you've always been intent on is um, building a company where people can come and c create Bezat to be a platform for people to realize their true potential and continue to grow. And, and another, I think, key aspect is, you know, be themselves. Um, and so what influenced your 
thinking around building a company where culture and the way people feel and the focus on people was was built into the fabric of the company at such a such an early stage i mean for selfish reasons i think it was obvious to me from the very beginning we need to be able to hire the best people and retain them and when people have a sense of purpose which could be as simple as working with others who are great and coming every day to to challenge them on their ideas um, and developing that sense of camaraderie or you know being a team they were going to work harder and they were going to work better and they were going to push the company to new limits and to do that we had to make sure we were hiring people with similar characteristics similar traits which then became culture i think that was the the big one and the second one was just i thought to myself at a very practical level anyone we hire is going to join us because they don't like something about where they are today they don't like their boss they don't like the staff of the company so let's not be that company let's not give them a reason to dislike bezat and where they work and that was a very very simple view i had and that's why i said let's build a great culture i know what it was like to wake up and not want to go to work i never want that to happen at bezat so bezat's gone kind of through three different uh evolutions uh, in terms of business model slash focus. One is how do you keep investors uh, excited about the journey as you continue to change up the business or how the business is aligned around specific focus. So that's the first. And then I'll, uh, I'll reserve the second for for when you answer that so one is you know fundraising is as much about the story as it is about the numbers right people who looked at uber as a ride hailing company weren't willing to give it you know the 40 billion valuation or whatever valuation ipo at. but people who are willing to look at it as one of the best logistic plays logistics plays in the world were willing to give it that valuation same numbers, same company, very different story and narrative. So I think that's a very important part of engaging with investors and, and raising money. Now, I don't subscribe to the school of thought that there's only one story you need to put out there because every investor is different. Every investor has different experiences. Um, some are much more focused on numbers. Others are more just focused on long-term vision. Others are just obsessed about the team you're building and the people you have. And your story has to resonate with whoever you're trying to raise money from. Having said that, one learning I do have over time is don't assume your investors have conviction, the same type of conviction that you have. Very rare to find investors who have very strong conviction, even about the businesses they're investing in especially in the last three years, a lot of them have FOMO and that's why they're investing more so than strong conviction in the business. And just talking to them, you could see how shaky that conviction is. You can see the same company they invested in two years later or a year later, they don't believe in that space anymore. So, what that means for you as a founder is you need to be very strong and not deviate from your vision. And something my dad told me very early on when I was starting Bezat was nobody will ever be as excited about your idea as you are and don't expect them to be. If investors lose trust in the company, in the vision, you can't take that personally. They have a lot of things going on themselves, a lot of different reasons why they could lose trust. And you just have to be strong. You have to be stubborn um, and just focus on your team and pushing through. It's only when the story's ended that people will come and congratulate you. As the company has kind of reshifted its focus, you know, two or three times, how do you 
how do you as kind of the CEO maintain the conviction that these are the right things to do? Because at a specific point in time, when you're on a path or on a journey, you already have the conviction that this is the way we should go. And this is the vision of the company and this is where we're going. And then so to be able to change that, not once, but more than once, uh, or maybe use, I'll use the word adapt versus change. To do that more than once, where do you find kind of the conviction that actually this is the right thing to do? So the aspiration for me is continue to be the same since we did the initial pivot from B2C fintech to, you know, employee platform, employee benefits, which is I want to get to a stage where almost every employee in the markets where, in which we're operating are asking their HR, their company, why doesn't our company use Bezat? It's so cool. We need to use that our company. Now, I never obsessed or I could care less about the industry that I'm in. So people say, are you an HR software? Are you insurance broker? I don't care. Why does it matter? And no one ever has a good response as to why it matters other than, oh, because depending on which one you're in, your valuation will be different, your multiple. And there's some truth to that, but at the same time, my valuation depends on my financials, right? What's my retention rate? What's my unit economics? What's my growth rate? What's my gross profit margin? Which is kind of inadvertently what they're trying to say, but they're trying to find an easy way to define you so that it's simpler for investors. And my views find just define me as the one that's going to give us the highest multiple. I'll buy into it. I'm not going to obsess over it because my customer doesn't care about that. That question never comes from customers. They never say, I'm not going to use you because you're from this industry versus this industry. They care about what you do for them, how you help them, what problems you solve for them. So I always found that, you know, very strange. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because that allows us to adapt, right? Because we're just focused on what are the things we can do for our customers. A lot of especially traditional companies are boxed in and they won't do something they should be doing. They won't change the direction they're going in because it's not something that banks do, right? Or it's not something that accounting firms do or law firms do. And they're losing out on big opportunities. With that mindset, we still have the same vision, but we're able to adapt. The second part here, which is a bit more long-term, is the average lifespan for companies are shorter than they've ever been. You know, even, you know, Fortune 500 companies, companies on the S&P 500, on the Dow Jones. So the probability is if you don't change, you'll die pretty quickly. Change has to be a good thing. It's the only way to survive. The pace of change is so much faster than it was even 10 years ago. So companies have to be adapting faster than they ever have before. Along this path, uh, kind of building the company now for seven years, what comes to mind when when you think about some of the toughest challenges you as a as a founder had to had to overcome? I get asked this question a lot, and I always struggle to answer it. I mean, look, there's a lot of challenges. I'd say for me personally, was just learning to be more present in the moment, because that's how I could give the best version of myself to my colleagues to my team to help them execute in their specific roles. So that was the biggest challenge because any morning I wake up, there's a hundred things I have to do. And that list just keeps getting longer and longer. And if I'm sitting there thinking about them while I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one meeting, while I'm brainstorming with someone, then I'm not operating at a high level. I can only operate at a high level when um, I'm in the moment. So I would say that's the ongoing challenge. There's obviously been a lot of you know business challenges from uh, fundraising, being close to running out of money, um, the financial, uh, sorry, the uh, COVID pandemic, um, things of that nature, but I don't control those things. They're all you know, external factors in many ways. So they weren't really challenges, they were obstacles. Right. The challenge was actually how I reacted in those moments. When you ask me what are the biggest challenges, it's always about me. Right. Long ago, I got rid of, you know, this grass is always greener mentality because I got rid of that. Again, I just have an execution mindset. 
I'm just going to do what it takes. And there's an interesting quote, right, which is, the man who loves walking will walk further than the man who loves the destination or the woman. So, you know, from that perspective, um, just learning to enjoy walking. And that's how we'll get through every challenge. You have to enjoy the things you're doing. If you don't enjoy the things you're doing, whatever role you're in, then you're not really going to get very far. So if you're the founder who's like, oh, I hate fundraising, or oh, I hate dealing with collections from customers, um, I hate hiring, then what are you doing? Why are you doing this? If you're just doing this because you think something good's going to happen in the future that's going to come out of it, um, that's a pretty big risk because you're spending a lot of energy and years of your life trying to get there. And if you don't get there, then you just went through hell for no reason. How do you define success for you personally? Uh, I think I speak to a lot of founders where success, and even I catch myself in that trap sometimes, right? It's, uh, you know, I'm fortunate to have a very amazing and supportive wife and she helps ground me many times where I, I catch myself in this unfortunate cycle or loop of defining success by financial terms. And, but I see a lot of people doing that. Um, and so kind of looking through the, the lens of the grass is not always greener on the other side. How do you define success for you, for you personally? So look, the, the financial rewards and, you know, making a hundred million dollars, it's not success, it's winning, right? I, I mean, I cannot have become an athlete, but say I was an athlete, right? Um, my arena is the sports arena and winning is winning games, right? When you're in business, um, financial metrics are how you count score and everyone wants to win. So I want those things, but not because that's what success is, because that's what it means to win in the business world. Building the most profitable company. I don't worry too much about what success is because it's something that's only true in a, in a moment of time for me success is getting better every day but i'm not going to get better every day some days i'm going to get worse um so i was only successful the previous day in this case and when people say what defines success i ask them why is it important no one can answer that question what do you mean i mean i'll ask you why is your definition of success important this is uh just to clarify this is a one-way uh interview it's not a yeah. it's not a it's not a two-way uh but i get what you're saying essentially you're 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 saying that we're obsessed what, what i'm hearing you say is that we're obsessed with this idea of how do you define success and 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 who who really cares about the definition of success or what success even is right as long as kind of collecting the, the points from your philosophies so far, who cares about what success is as long as you're enjoying the ride. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I think it's very easy to get obsessed with the destination, right? Uh, that's something I've had to, I vacillate, I kind of go back and forth between these two extremes of uh, really understanding that the journey I'm on right now is in the present moment is the most important thing and enjoying that versus at times getting obsessed with the destination of and what that outcome looks like. And so uh, I think it's, it's easier said than done, but you're absolutely right. Just focusing on the destination takes away from the experience in the present moment yeah i mean it's a much better way to live and again you're going to perform substantially better when you're focused on the destination a lot of times you're giving half your energy or brain power to executing theoretically easy to talk about being uh, present and enjoying the journey versus the destination um, especially when things are smooth sailing uh, or generally manageable. I mean, in practical terms, can you share an example of a pretty tough time that you went through 
managing the business where you were to, able to apply this mindset or this mentality? So when we wanted to raise our Series B round, we wanted to get international investors on board, right? And the reality is we had exhausted all the local investors. The ones that liked us had given us money. The ones who didn't like us, people won't usually change their mind. And we couldn't really rely on a lot of our shareholders at the time to make introductions to investors around the world because it was still a young ecosystem. They didn't really have that network. And so a chicken egg situation, which is most investors like to invest with other investors that they've invested with previously in other companies, right? That's how you get new investors. Usually an existing investor will be like, oh, we invested with this company and then they'll bring them on board. Um, and that's just, you know, part of cognitive bias, right? Because uh, familiarity bias, right? So they know each other, but also they'll think that that investor is like me because they invest in the same company, so they're smart. So if they look at other companies, you know, we should consider them as well. So we couldn't take advantage of that. In a very long process, I had to do cold outreach to 300 plus investors from Hong Kong to China to Russia, India, UK, um, and then the US as well. And that was a very monotonous process in some ways, but also very difficult process because your conversion rates, you know, 1%. At the same time, you have a timeline, you need to close around so that you run out of money. And I wouldn't say the mindset was necessarily, oh, I'm loving this experience, but it was, look, it's part of the journey, right? Um, and every day just woke up, just like any other day, I had tasks to do. Maybe it wasn't my favorite task, right? Um, but I still had to do it, so I just got on with it. And that was... A journey of you know six seven months maybe eight months if i can't remember exactly that was every single day for those eight months just waking up saying i need to go talk to investors reach out getting rejected i never felt super stressed about it yeah i did definitely had some highs some lows you know you get overexcited sometimes but for the most part I just just did it right i just went out and and, and did it um and I did generally enjoy some of those experiences as well, right? So, for example, I got to travel um, and travel on my own, which I've never done, you know, um, uh, in the past. So those were cool moments. I got to speak to some pretty high-caliber investors that were, you know, famous, world-renowned. That was a cool experience as well. So, and then the last one is I built this amazing database, and I was genuinely excited to say I had built this database that none of our investors had. I've shared with a couple entrepreneurs. They found it very useful. So there was meaning to that whole exercise. Don't seem They don't necessarily seem like huge rewards, but they're enough to get you by. Now, as kind of the, the company scales, you know, you, you guys are uh, entering new markets and, you know, the company will will probably reach over 400 people, you know, in, in 2022. What, what have you, uh, in the process of becoming a CEO of a bigger company, a company that's multi-country footprint, uh, how have you as a CEO had to evolve yourself? Actually, let me ask you, let me, let me ask you as you're answering that question, what is the moment or what is the story of, 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 of when you realized, oh shit, I need to, I need to evolve myself. Like the talad of 30, 40, 50 person Bezat can't be the talad of, or maybe he can be. I'm just uh, making some, some assumptions, as they say. I mean, from the very beginning, right? I was very introverted. I had to learn how to get out of my shell, get out of my comfort zone. I had to start learning how to do sales how to do public speaking, that started in university. And then as a CEO, you know, I had to learn how to build trust with people better, which meant becoming vulnerable. So the moment I realized it was um, honestly, probably from reading is one, right? Which is 
reading about these great leaders, how they are, the things they do, seeing how far I was from that. But then also I was saying, they did it, why can't I? Um, learning, you know, I had to change my habits, right? I had to um, invest substantially more in meditation, which I never did before. But I could see the benefits of doing that, and I made it part of my routine. So if you're not getting better, in some ways you're getting worse. You can't, you know, you can't be static. So for me, it's something that I realized probably mostly in university when I had to start getting out of my shell because uh, I wouldn't have gotten good grades, right? Uh, I had to, my, my senior year was all presenting to these professors who've done amazing things. One guy was the first guy who ever operated um, on the heart with a laser. The other guy was a pediatric surgeon. So, you know, doing surgery on, on newborn babies. Um, very famous people in their fields. And I was scared to death of speaking publicly. And I had to learn to do it because that's the only way for me to get an A in the class. And how did you learn? How did you tackle learning public speaking? I did some research. I saw what are the techniques. And I just tried them. You know, I didn't know if they were going to work, but I just tried them. So literally standing in front of a mirror and doing the presentation or the speech and doing it over and over and over again. So practice. And the lesson there is, you know, if you practice anything at all, you can get pretty decent at it. You just have to put in the time. Um, every single skill you need to acquire as a leader, you can just practice giving feedback. You can practice that. You just have to put in the time. I'm not the best speech giver, but I'm much better than I was a couple of years ago. But again, that's through putting in the time, preparing and practicing. I was even able to change my sleeping habits just by gradu you know, by, by changing what time I woke up, by sleeping less. I always thought I needed, you know, nine hours. I can now sleep seven, eight hours. Um, most people will tell you, oh, you know, I'm not a morning person or oh, I need X hours of sleep. But well, you can train yourself to do anything you want to do. They call it self-limiting beliefs, right? And all of us have them. Um, and if you just focus on, I'll do what it takes to get to where I want to be, I'll do what's necessary, then it's a very matter of fact of approach. Let me just start practicing it. What's an example of a time where you had a self-limiting belief that you think kind of either held you back or you realize that this is a self-limiting belief and I need to kind of break the mold? Like what's the specific instance where you can recall that that was the case? Man, so many. Public speaking. I suck at sales. I don't like to do small talk. So I'm not going to get into it with team members. You know, just come in. We're very so business friendly. I'm not an emotional person. I can't bond with people who are emotional. This is a laundry list of self-limiting beliefs. Yeah, for sure. And like, let's take one now. Like, I know one that's been uh, something you've been very purposeful about in tackling. An example of kind of the, either in personal or professional life, but an example where you started to realize that, you know, I'm not an emotional person. I can't connect with emotional people where that self-limiting belief you realized that it was at play and then how you started actually saying, okay, no, I, I, this is something I can tackle. So what's, what's an example from your personal or, or professional life where that self-limiting belief came to bear fruit? Look, they all build on each other, right? As soon as you get rid of one self-limiting belief, then you start questioning, why can't I do this? Why do I think this? Um, and for me, probably the, you know, the big one was, yeah, I don't, I'm not good at building, you know, personal connections and bonds with people. And the reason was, I had no good reason once I thought about it. Why do, why do I think I can't do that with people? What's an example of a, um, you know, a time where the self-limiting belief of I can't, uh, build emotional connections with people 
popped its head out and how did you kind of start to overcome that self-limiting belief what do you mean by popped its head out like you you noticed like an example either in your personal life if whether it's in your uh, personal life or professional life where you said actually there's the the self-limiting belief right now at play which is i can't build emotional connections and i need to kind of address this self-limiting belief the very obvious one is is of course getting married right um if, having that self-limiting belief and then getting married and then trying to build a close bond with your partner or spouse um you'll get into trouble very quickly right that's definitely forced me to to change and then you know going into the company um there was one or two times where i was just completely blindsided by someone's actions um and the fact that they never you know spoke to me before they carried out those actions whether it was leaving the company or doing a host of other things and for me i build trust just by doing things with people and um you know up front i trust you up front and then um you don't really have to earn it it can go away and where i realized is this person i thought very highly of and i continue to think highly of they operate in a very different way which is they build trust through emotional connection and i used to actually see that as a weakness in people for the longest time but that instance showed me that it wasn't a weakness it was just people operate differently and i was so like minded to this person in so many other areas it kind of showed me that you know what you can be strong you can be smart you could be very intellectually capable but still be an emotional person when it matters what's the end game for you when it's all said and done in life there's no end game i mean i'm i'm i don't really believe in legacy and things like that i'm here so i should just make the best of it to the point that i'm not here it's not it's not really philosophical it's just practical i mean i have to accomplish you know things at the company I have to create a liquidity event we have to exit we took on money from investors that's expectation um those are all things that we need to do but they're not end games right um they're just part of the job so the company we have a vision right to make a world class employee experience accessible to every company we'll achieve that once we've achieved that then i'll find something else to do something else to to uh strive for and maybe that is the end game right is to just always make sure we're we're moving forward there's no final destination i heard you say a couple of things uh i heard you say that you know if you practice you can get pretty decent at anything it just requires putting in the time I heard you say cycles will always come and go and people just have short memories. One thing that I I really like that stuck with me as well was, you know, no matter how good things are, they could be better and no matter how bad things are, they could be worse. You know, I didn't realize that, you know, a long time ago you got rid of the grass is always greener on the other side and I think it's a great way to to live. <music> This is uh um, been uh backed by popular demand this conversation probably it was uh one of the episodes that uh, a lot of people ping me saying you know we'd love to see Talal on the on the podcast I get the uh the fortune or misfortune uh of uh working with you every day and I know that the Bezat story is still being written and it will be a great one but i also know that along the way there's been a ton of obstacles against many odds you know we're we're continuing to uh, push forward and that's really under under your leadership and vision and so as a as a co-founder um 
and as a brother, I can just say, you know, I'm super proud of everything you've accomplished and the things you will continue to accomplish. Thanks a lot for taking the time today. Thank you for having me.